Hello and welcome. <laughs> Today we are talking about the skinny on fat and I'm the doc. I'm Hachi. Welcome, welcome. <laughs> and thank you, Don and Thomas. We'll give you guys a shout out. <laughs> Don and Thomas are here. <laughs> Woo! Now so, it's a party. Now it's a party. All right. So today we wanted to talk about fat because fat is a widely misunderstood part of our diet. Mm -hmm. And it, the, the misconception goes back many, many years. And it's one of the many reasons why we are where we are now with uh, health issues. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. So if you want to go over the like history, like they thought it was fat and then- The history of fat. The history of fat. Okay. <laughs> so real quick, um, just, just to keep it brief, I nerd out on the history, not everybody does. 1977, the McGovern Commission, uh, led by George McGovern, uh, was looking into what the government could do to help uh, with heart health. Um, the heart attacks are on the rise. Um, the very first time the American politicians got involved in heart health was when Dwight Eisenhower, President Eisenhower, had a heart attack while he was president. There was a, a renewed interest in, in uh, heart health. But then by the time in 1977, the McGovern Commission, same thing, uh, George McGovern had had a heart attack. He put together a commission to study what would be the most ideal diet. Um, one of his uh, what they, I'm so forget what they call it now, an aide, yeah, one of his aides, one of his congressional aides, was um, a vegetarian and, and had been a vegetarian for life, and he sold George. The funny thing, when you almost die of something, whoever talks to you next, it's kind of like a goose. Well, whoever it sees first, that's its mother. But when, sometimes when people have a, a near a near end experience, whoever gets their ear first will get a lot of traction with them. That's how people end up with, like, the crazy, like, oh, well, and I, not trashing homeopathy, but like, homeopathy cured my cancer. And it's how, like, some of these Maybe. weird claims kind of come around, but right. anyway. Right, and that, that's, whenever, uh, one of the things I always, I, I've heard this many times, well, my uncle had, God forbid, my uncle had cancer, and then he started eating only the shells of clams, and now his cancer's gone. Okay, I... There's a couple of things about that. Is that the cause? And two, um, I don't have cancer. Not find everything available. Should I eat like someone who's trying to, you know, suspend their cancer? Right. Anyway, so so George McGovern, uh, well intended, put together this commission with this particular aid, really pushing the show. And what every piece of science that ran across his desk that said you should eat animal products and saturated fat—that's the healthiest way to go—he dismissed and can't cherry picked information to come up with cholesterol and fat are bad for you and they cause heart attacks. What we've seen in the last 30 plus years since the 1977 government commission report is that uh, the, the government has, has uh, published year after year that we should be eating a diet based on grains and carbohydrates. Yeah, do you remember the food pyramid? The pyramid. Right. Where grains are at the bottom. Yeah. Right. And then next up is beer. And then right above <laughs> that is I want to say that was like, <laughs> I can't remember because they changed it. So I, I, it, 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 it flipped I, around. I remember and, looking at it back in the day and being like, this doesn't make sense. And I don't yeah. think I can eat that much bread if I wanted to. <laughs> but with 30 years later, uh, instances of, uh, and I want to be careful here because people, it, it can be hard to keep a statistic isolated within yes. its own context. The amount of heart disease we have now exceeds what we had in 1977 by a factor, I looked this up today, close to 300% more heart disease. Fewer people die of heart attacks. That's because people recognize the early signs of a heart attack. Mm -hmm. Most people have a phone with them at all times. Yeah. Many people are CPR and first aid certified. It can help somebody before paramedics uh, and other first responders arrive. So you survive your heart attack better. But we're not having any fewer heart attacks than half. In fact, we're having quite a bit more mm -hmm. uh, angina and other initial cardiac incidents. Yeah. Rates of cancer are up and diabetes and overweight are through the roof. Mm -hmm. Back in the day, we used to call it, um, they used to call it childhood diabetes and we called it adult onset diabetes. So they've stopped calling them that. It's now type one mm -hmm. and type two because so many children are now getting diabetes Mm -hmm. But it's obviously yeah. not adult onset. And it all ties back to this, this switching from fat as a primary fuel source in our diet 
to carbohydrate as a primary. AKA source. sugar, for those of you who watch The Truth of Carbohydrates. Sure. Oh man, it's all coming back together. <laughs> now I know that, that was quick and dirty, but that's basically how did we get here? That's basically how we got here. Exactly, and it's, and it's too bad too, because if you remember your high school biology, <laughs> Which I sat next to this really cute girl. <laughs> That's what I remember. <laughs> That's why I'm a doctor. Laurie and, uh, Greer, if you're out there, <laughs> I hope you're good. I hope you're fine. <laughs> you were fine then. I hope you're still fine. I loved your ankles. <laughs> so on YouTube, they ask, is this child, is this child appropriate material? It used you're going to have to mark it no today. It used to be. <laughs> but so fat is widely misunderstood. And if you remember from your biology classes, <laughs> Um, if anybody remembers the cell membrane, so the membrane that goes around a cell, um, the phospholipid bilayer, so two layers of phospholipids, lipids being fat. So fat is necessary to make every single cell membrane. That was a cell. That's a cell. <laughs> so every cell has a membrane that goes around it made out of fat, and your body is made up of cells. So if you are not getting enough fat, you're not going to have healthy cell membranes. Right. So every cell That's in your body has a chance of having some sort of issue if you're not eating a lot, the good kinds of fat Correct. or enough fat. Second of all, it's crucial for your hormones. Your hormones are basically fat. So like, you, that's why you like cholesterol, for example, it's a type of fat. You need fat in your diet or your hormones are going to be off. Um, it's also, so without getting too far on a tangent, but if, uh, going back to how children's bodies have been changing because of what we're eating, um, men, menses used to start around like 14, 12 to 14. That's when they were supposed to start. Technically 14, if you go from a Chinese calendar, women have a, a change in their body every seven years. Men have a change every eight. So that's why girls start to go through puberty around 14. Men, it's they're 16. When women are done by about 21, men 24. You guys are a little slow. 48. <laughs> well, midlife crisis is around. 62. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> anyway, so girls are supposed to start to get their periods around 14. But what's happening is girls are having their periods sooner and sooner and sooner. So some girls, like as long as like 10 and, and 9, are starting to get their periods. And it's a function of a lot of different things, but primarily fat. So what happens is as you're growing and you start to get like your, your breasts and everything, you're supposed to be getting more fat. And once you reach a certain threshold of fat, that's when your period's supposed to start. So these girls who are heavier when they're younger, they're getting their periods sooner because their body's confused and thinks like, oh, well, it's time. Um, and then on the other hand, when you get too much weight on you, when you have too much body fat, it actually turns off your period. So if you've ever heard those stories where a woman didn't realize she was pregnant, she was so heavy, people think, oh, well, she's so heavy, she didn't realize she had children. She didn't put on, like, however many pounds you put on with a child. Like, right. when she didn't fact, necessarily didn't have happen in two that. weeks, yeah. Usually they don't realize because they haven't had a regular period for a while. Because right. once you reach a certain body fat, your period will turn back off. Because our body, you, you need to be healthy to have a baby. And so when you're too skinny or too heavy, your body's not healthy, so it turns it off, essentially. That's just the, the again, short and dirty version of right. what is it's we'll do We'll do uh, fertility another time. Exactly, <laughs> so, and then along that line, um, fertility is greatly impacted by this stuff because if your hormones are out of balance, you're gonna have trouble right. having a child, and that's, fertility is way on the rise, too. Um, um, it's, uh, all, uh, all hormones are created out of cholesterol, out of fat at some level. So uh, a lot of men get treated for low testosterone levels when they get up to be, you know, like me, if you get 35 or so years of age and they can have lower testosterone. I like that answer. Lower <laughs> testosterone levels. And instead of getting a patch or a pill or whatever, maybe, you know, eat, have a little uh, uh, saturated fat in your diet mm -hmm. at a time, a little bit, and, and that can help. Exactly. And then the last thing that is another part of fat that's crucial is it literally makes up your brain. Your brain is made out of fat. Are you you're, calling me a fathead? You're a fathead. I knew it. <laughs> so what happens, without getting too nerdy, is that the nerves <laughs> are uh, long, and they're supposed to send impulses from your brain down to like the tips of your fingers, tips of your toes. And it needs to get there quickly, otherwise your reaction time is going to be slow. So if you're like, dodge this, poof. <laughs> if it takes too long, you know, things happen. It's 
reflexes are important amongst every other thing. I don't know anything about it. <laughs> so what happens is that to get the nerves to transmit quickly, you either need to have a giant nerve that then makes it go back and forth quickly. So you have transatlantic cable. Huh? Yeah, exactly. You need a huge cable. That's what like a squid has, for example. They have giant spinal cords that are very big. But we can't, we can't do that. Like our, ours are very, very tiny. It's hard to see, um, especially towards the ends of your fingers and stuff. So what our body has done is put myelin around it. So it's basically like a sheath of fat around the nerve. And what happens is that, say that you've got multiple sheaths, what happens is it literally jumps over the fat. And when you start to have a demyelinating disease, when you start to lose the fat on your nerves, it jumps has to travel, jumps has to travel. The jumping is super fast, but the traveling is slow. So that's why uh, cognitive decline is a big problem is because if you're not getting enough fat, <laughs> to have a healthy brain, you can have problems. If you're not having enough fat, maybe you're getting numbness and tingling in your hands, et cetera, et cetera. There's so many things it affects. Yes. And that's why some studies have shown that if you can give people with dementia like a couple tablespoons of coconut oil, a couple uh, hour, like an hour later, they'll it's do true. better on those dementia tests that someone was bragging about passing. I can, Ryan O. Ryan O. The dementia tests are not an <laughs> IQ test. I need to say this to somebody, even if it's the void. An IQ, IQ test is not the same as a dementia test. I took it. Congratulations, you passed the dementia <laughs> test. All it means is you don't have dementia, and if you thought it was hard, that's part of the test. <laughs> so, yes. Um, anyway, take your coconut oil. So. <laughs> <laughs> All of you. All Especially of you. if you hold public office. <laughs> yes. Have some coconut oil. Have some coconut oil. Um, Dr. David Perlmutter's book, Grain Brain, great source of how uh, saturated fat in your diet leads to a protection against cognitive decline. Do it. Exactly, yeah. So I wanted to get into, like, well, what fats are we talking about? Because there's tons of fats that get a lot of attention, but again, yes. like we talked about, are widely misunderstood. So we'll start with HDL and LDL. Ooh, ooh. My favorites. <laughs> So HDL is high density lipoproteins and LDLs is low density lipoproteins. Correct. So there you go. The first thing to say about to those, know. not to totally geek out on as you know us, we love the details. We do love we, the details. We really scream in the details, not to confuse you. But just point of fact, uh, as you can hear in the name, high density lipoprotein is not fat. It's a protein. Yeah, lipoprotein, it's a fat protein. It's a fat protein, right. Um, it, these, your levels of these things will in will sort of be an indicator of where your cholesterol level is, but these particular things are not in and of themselves uh, your cholesterol. Exactly, yeah, that's why they measure several things, HDL, LDL, triglycerides, triglycerides and total cholesterol, and if you've got a good doctor, they're checking um, your very low density here, the V LDLs. V LDLs they, and particulate size. Exactly, Those. if you remember our sugar talk mm. with the sugar's scraping the arteries and then the cholesterol's coming as a band-aid. Oh. It's <laughs> actually more important to know about these very low density lipoproteins and the particulate size because that tells you how healthy your cholesterol is essentially. Right. Um, because cholesterol level all by itself, we'll, we'll get into this, but cholesterol level all by itself is not an indicator of your heart health. Exactly. It really is. It's more there's about, more to it. There's ratios. As always, yeah. it's about balance. Correct. So what are these things? So uh, the LDLs and the HDLs each have a function. So LDLs bring cholesterol to your body. So they go into your arteries and veins and they take cholesterol wherever it needs to go. So if you're trying to make like a hormone, maybe it's bringing it to the place where the hormones are made. It's uber for cholesterol. It's uber. <laughs> exactly. They're cholesterol ubers. I like that. Ubers. So the LDLs, the bad cholesterol, brings it elsewhere. And like we talked about, if you have artery damage from the sugar and the insulin, it's going to bring cholesterol to the injury to try to fix it. So that's why it's considered bad is because it's bringing the cholesterol to the sites and they were blaming it for the clots. But we know it's sugar. We know it's sugar. If we, I mean, inflammation. And inflammation. If we could create a drug tomorrow that would absolutely block your ability to create LDL. Uh, you'd die. You'd be dead within... A day? I, I don't know how long it would take. Would, but you it die. wouldn't take long for you to die. Um, we course, have it for a reason. Yeah, transport of cholesterol out to the out to the body is absolutely necessary for cellular regrowth, and without it, you die. 
Yeah, it's how it gets around. Yeah. It's just a bus. It's it, you don't blame the bus for for the, the accidents. Unmarked police <laughs> military people who are in that bus. <laughs> That's the real problem. I'm not referencing anything in particular. Just saying, just Lucas. <laughs> 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 so that's LDL. So it's considered bad because it's bringing the cholesterol out to where they think the damage is. HDL gets its wrap as a good cholesterol because I'm, it's. I'm a good cholesterol. I'm good. So the HDL <laughs> brings the cholesterol from the rest of your body to your liver to be filtered out of your body. So it's getting rid of the cholesterol. So that's one of the reasons why they're always looking for things that boost HDL and decrease LDL because you want to get rid of. That in, and I'm just saying medical theory, you want to get rid of the cholesterol, so you want to bump up the HDL right. to get rid of cholesterol, because they think cholesterol is a problem, decrease LDL so they stop putting it everywhere else and let it right. get out of there. But what we're finding is, again, they put you on these drugs to change these cholesterol levels and stuff, and what they find is that when you start suppressing cholesterol production and all this other stuff, you actually end up with more heart attacks. Because, Oddly enough. Well, and from what we understand, again, from the sugar talk, we're not going to redo the whole sugar talk. You go watch that video. Watch it. Watch, watch it. Watch it. Like it. Subscribe. It's um, homework. It's homework. <laughs> but when you have all this unaddressed damage, you're still going to end up with a problem. It doesn't matter if you're not getting a plaque. And, and the other thing, too, is your body finds a way. It's kind of like Jurassic Park. Life finds a way. Life will happen, right? <laughs> it will. So you, there's only so much you can do. But along um, that line, often what happens is an aside. If people are on statin drugs, this all read the side effects of the statins if you're ever put on them. And once you've read that, <laughs> get back to us. Yeah, talk to me, and I'll, I'll get I'll get you to lower lower the doctor's expectations and, and be healthy without that drug. But um, I know folks who go on statins and at the same time change their diet so that they're not in consuming any cholesterol whatsoever, they go back six months later, doctor checks them, we're good, they go back another six months later, uh-oh, cholesterol levels creeping back up. Mm -hmm. Your body knows you need it, your liver will just produce more. Exactly, and especially if you have unmitigated arterial damage, like if you, don't if you really don't change what you're eating, like if you continue to eat sugar and other inflammatory foods, you're going to continue the cycle of inflammation and your body needs to put band-aids on it, it will find a way of doing it, so. It's not a good long-term solution. Exactly. So uh, let me underscore what I just said. Dietary cholesterol is not the only source of blood serum cholesterol. Your liver makes it. Exactly. So, and what they've been finding is that honestly, with um, dietary cholesterol, has really no relationship to blood cholesterol. Not Whether really. you eat more or eat less, it doesn't really change. It's actually more about the inflammation. If you can get the inflammation down, your cholesterol will come down. And so along that line. That's getting into the ratios. Mm -hmm. HDL to cholesterol, total cholesterol levels, tend to be the most important thing. Yeah. What you want to do is you want to have the ratio below five. So when you have the total cholesterol, I had to write it down because I sure, just eat better and you'd be fine. She's not a cardiologist. I'm not a cardiologist. But so <laughs> the total cholesterol to HDL should be five to one. At the max, that when you start to get close to five is when you start to have heart disease. Uh, the American Heart Association and all that jazz, they think an ideal one is closer to 2.5. Notice how that's not zero. So, Can I tell you how that happened? <laughs> they did a study Real a few quick. years ago, very quickly. A study a few years ago uh, out of India. It was a fantastic study. Broad, broad, broad population. Uh, really well done. And they found out that people who had normal to low cholesterol levels had heart attacks at a rate higher than people who did not. So, instead of taking that in and reassessing this whole cholesterol thing, they just said, well, the, your ratio should just be even tighter. Right. Pretty soon it's going to be so tight you should, that, that it's going to be impossible to reach. Exactly, yeah. So, ratios are more where it's at. So, like when I was in school, we had a teacher, who, Dr. Ruddy, he was great. Um, he taught our nutrition class. Hi, Cleo. <laughs> they saw you. So he taught our nutrition class, and his total cholesterol was like over 200, but his HDLs were close to like 120, I think. Wow. Like it was ridiculous. That's um, amazing. Like 40 is generally like, oh my God, you got so high. Um, but his HDL was super high, so he's like, I'm not concerned at all because my HDLs are high and they're doing their job. And so he didn't worry about it. So that's why the HDL, the LDL, all these ratios are what matter. But again, if you eat healthy food, AKA getting rid of inflammatory foods, your, your cholesterol stuff will sort itself out. It's true. Right, Cleo? 
I know. <laughs> Fish oil. Fish oil. We give her <laughs> salmon oil and hemp oil to calm her down. <laughs> I know, it's not working. <laughs> She's just mad we got home late, right? I know. We have to keep talking, Kitty. So, <laughs> so, okay, so then what are good fats? What's bad fat? Okay. So, there's different types of fat that you consume. There's monounsaturated, polyunsaturated, saturated, and trans fat. Those are the big um, categories. Yes. So. Can we, can we just start with trans fat? Yes. Don't eat it. Don't eat it. There we go. Next. Trans, <laughs> trans fat is, is the, tr like, out of all of it, it's the only real bad fat. Because it's fake fat, essentially. Yeah. It's, it's screwed up fat. So what happens is that um, with various processes, um, they hydrogenate oil. And when they hydrogenate it, it changes it, and yeah. it's been shown to cause cancer. Yeah. So that's why trans fat was banned. Um, they were using it because it's cheaper, because it, they can use cheap oil and ruin it <laughs> and use it. So they were making more money. So yeah. but they, they found that the, the side effects were bad, so that's when at the fast food started getting a lot of attention in the media, when they were, oh, trans fat. Like I, I'm sure some of you remember when they started banning it. So it's been banned. Right. But the problem is, is that they haven't banned partially hydrogenated oils, Correct. which are not better. <laughs> like, no, they're, they're really not. And you, can, you actually find them a lot if you look in processed foods. You gotta just be careful. That's one of the reasons you gotta label read. But hydrogenated oil and par partially hydrogenated oil are trans fat. They cause cancer. They are bad. They're really bad. Um, for anyone who works in the restaurant industry, if you've ever tried to clean a fryer later after it's been used with trans fats for a, a couple of months, the trans fats will evaporate and then they cling to the uh, friolator and then when they harden, they are like a lacquer that does not come off. I wonder what that's like in your veins. It does the same thing to your liver. So, yeah. Yeah, so, don't eat trans fats. Don't eat trans fats. So that's the only one we're gonna put the kibosh on aside from like different, certain foods, but we'll talk about that. Yeah. So mono unsaturated fat is the one that gets the most attention for being a good fat. It's olive oil and avocados, olives, nuts. That's monounsaturated fat. It's just talking about um, the number of chemical bonds. So if it's saturated, all the bonds are filled. If it's unsaturated, not all the bonds are filled. That's all you need to know. Pretty much. Um, and then there's mono is one is filled and, and poly is some filled. number. Right. So that's monounsaturated. There. Chemistry in a nutshell, Thomas. <laughs> so... Monounsaturated is the one that gets all of the attention in the media, yeah. and when you go online, it's the one that's considered the good fat. But it's not the only good fat. No. Polyunsaturated and saturated fat are also good for you. They've yes. been very misunderstood. Polyunsaturated, they also get to be considered good, not as good as mono, but good. Mm -hmm. That's sunflowers, sesame seeds, pumpkin seeds, flax seed, walnuts, and fatty fish. All nuts and seeds and fish. Yeah. That's polys. Exactly. Yeah. So. That's the poly. So the mono and poly unsaturated are universally considered good. We don't have to talk about them. Saturated fat. Now that's the real question. Mm -hmm. And if you go on like Healthline or any of these other websites, they'll spend all this time talking about how like this is bad, this is bad. Like we talked about inflammation. I was looking it up. So under like what's saturated fat? Saturated fat is animal products like butter and meat, um, the red meats, uh, beef, lamb, and pork, chicken skin, whole fat dairy, butter, lard, ice cream, and tropical oils like coconut oil Yum. and palm oil. Yum. So they'll start, they'll talk about how like, um, so like they consider healthy fat like soy, soy milk, tofu, peanuts, and canola oil, and vegetable oil because they're the unsaturated fats. And I'm like, you're out of your damn mind. So they consider those healthy, but then like, oh, be careful of the, the coconut oil. Mm -hmm. Like, what are you talking about? So we have to just just so to tap, go to that. tap the brakes for a second here and think. I just want to think logically about this. We, if you were to take a look at uh, human evolution and our presence on this planet, mm. and let's say we laid that out on a football field, right? The entire football field would be the amount of time that we have lived mm -hmm. without uh, polyunsaturated fats, right? Or, or, in a, as a, I mean, uh, as chemical fats is part of our diet. We had, yeah. Saturated fats primarily. Yes, poly, animal products. Poly and monos. We didn't have we, no canola oil that's yep. made in the laboratory. No corn oil. None of that. That's absolutely vital, according to the American Heart Association, for your health. Didn't exist. 
the time those have been on the planet has been since the 19 Stay in frame. since the <laughs> 1940s. It would be about one inch before the goal line is the only amount of time that human beings have had those in their diet. Mm -hmm. We How did they be essential if they well, weren't even here. We did fine before those things were ever created in a <laughs> laboratory. We actually did better. <laughs> right. And the, the, the first the first argument you get about that is, well, it used to be people only lived until they were 12 <laughs> or some other such dumbness. Uh, average life expectancy means that people died of diseases that we can now cure. People mm -hmm. got, uh, I don't want to even get into viruses and immunization right now, <laughs> but we polio took a lot of people that doesn't anymore. Childbirth killed a lot of babies and their mothers doesn't so much anymore. So the, there's, there's a lot of other things that have nothing to do with diet that have changed to make our lifespans longer. Um, if you go to, there's a couple of great cemeteries in Boston that have been there since the 1600s, and you can read the gravestones and see that quite a few people lived to be in, in their 70s, 80s, and 90s back then also. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just, we, we've been able to handle a lot of the infectious <laughs> diseases and, and other things like that. But yeah, so no, it's anything that is not found in nature, you shouldn't be eating. A, a very, I, I heard a great one. If it doesn't come from the ground, if it doesn't come from a tree, if it doesn't come from a bush, if it didn't come from an animal, if it didn't have a face and a mother, you shouldn't be eating it. Do oysters have mothers? No, but I heard, I got good authority tells me they read books. <laughs> it's a long story. Yeah, we'll talk about oysters that. Eating books. <laughs> so if it had a face, <laughs> if it had a mother, if it came from one of those things with a face and a mother, a bush, tree, ground, that's where it needs to come from. So well, its mother had a face. Its <laughs> mother had a face and a bush. What? <laughs> oh, stop it. Oh. <laughs> so anyway, if it if it's fake, it's it's just not good for you. It doesn't really matter what it is. And we are not smarter than Mother Nature. And I think we're starting to learn that as a a, a world right now. <laughs> um, so that's kind of the the way that it works. So mm. saturated fat, though mm. the animal fats. Sash fat. So. Yeah, as the doc, as the doc said, uh, our, our monos, our polys, uh, polyunsaturated fats, natural fats. Nobody disagrees that those are, are those good are you. good in your diet. Word of warning: um, olive oil and other um, other monounsaturated fats are very easy to break down if you overheat them. So if you're cooking with those those fats, you want to keep your temperatures low because you can break that thing down and it goes from being a good a uh, good fat to a bad one, actually, if you overcook it, if you overheat it. Yeah, if, um, you, if you heat it, it starts to break up the bonds, and, and like if you try to cook on higher heats with olive yeah. oil, you can't. It makes it rancid. And, and when it you, burns it off, yeah. And when you make an oil rancid, that actually kind of changes. I don't want to say it changes it to a trans fat, but it makes it bad. It oxidizes it, so you, it's not as healthy anymore. But, exactly. Um, saturated fat is the one that the, the medical establishment, for the most part, for what like we've said for 30 years, has been vilifying saturated fat as being the worst thing in the world for you. Mm -hmm. Now, before you go out, buy a tub of lard and start eating it straight with a spoon, <laughs> God help me. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, Don has the right reaction. Not for nothing, there are folks in the ketoverse and the paleoverse and the primalverse who will actually do things like that, that we've learned that fat's not so bad for you has become converted into fat's the only thing you should eat. Those people are crazy, um, those people are nuts. But uh, saturated fats, especially in the form of vegetable sources of fat, saturated fat, we can all agree on coconut oil, yeah. palm oil, yeah. um, are, are fine. Uh, they're really good for you. They're an excellent source of energy. Um, you, your body has to fuel itself on something. It's going to be sugar, as we've said before, or it's going to be fat. There's a reason why the body converts excess calories into saturated fat. If it were not a good food source, we wouldn't be carrying so much of it around. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Exactly. Saturated yeah. fat does not deserve the bad rap that it has. At three to four teaspoons, excuse me, tablespoons of saturated fat at every meal would would help you lose weight, convert you to fat burning, and mm -hmm. you, and you would feel a lot healthier. Exactly. Yeah. It's so. Right, Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> you got the right answer. I like Sausage. That. <laughs> yes, yeah, so animal fat have gotten has gotten a bad rap, but it's it's fine. But the thing you have to be careful about with fat is fat is where your body stores toxins, 
And we'll talk about that another day. We'll talk yes. about detoxing. It's very important for everybody to do it, mm -hmm. um, especially if you haven't been living, you know, like an angel your whole life. Right. Um, right. But and your animal, your animals are storing their toxins in their fat. Exactly. So the higher quality meat and fish you buy, the less toxins. You exactly. Have. So you have to be careful. And that's why we are very pro grass-fed, organic, hormone-free, et cetera. Yeah. Because uh, the, the extra growth hormone and stuff like that, that's stored in the fat, because it's, it's a fat-soluble thing. It gets stored in the fat, all the toxins. So if, antibiotics. Uh, antibiotics, all the stuff gets stored in the fat. Um, heavy metals, um, all sorts I love of heavy metal. <laughs> heavy metals especially get stored in your fat. So that's one of the reasons why when you start to lose weight, if you, especially if you lose it too quickly, um, you'll start to have a detox reaction and people sometimes freak out and they think it's bad, but it's actually good. Mm -hmm. It means your body's letting go of some of the, the, the toxin buildup. Sure. Um, Cause like they put fluoride in our water. Um, they used to put um, mercury and, and stuff in fillings. Like it's, um, that's the whole vaccine or one of the whole vaccine things, which I'm not going into, but that was one of the biggest concerns is that mercury is known as a neurotoxin. So it damages your nervous system. So when people said, oh, it doesn't cause autism, it's like, well, it damages the nervous system, so technically it could. How about we investigate? But instead of investigating, they just ripped the mercury out of, I think most, I don't want to say all, because I, I haven't looked at every single one, but that's one of the reasons they removed mercury out of it is because mercury is known to be a poison. There's no point to, why, it's a, it was considered a preservative and they thought it was safe. It's why mercury thermometers are gone. Right. That's why you can't just throw them out. You have to go bring them to hazardous waste. It's toxic. It's literally toxic. And especially those things like the fluoride, uh, bromide, everything in that chemical category, Thomas knows, the periodic table. <laughs> no pressure, Thomas. <laughs> so, but that periodic table of elements, that one, um, one column. the one column with the, like the bromine, the iodide, and, and, all, and fluoride, all that stuff. Those ones in particular, uh, I think it's the fluorocarbons. Mm -hmm. I'd have to relook at, I haven't taken chemistry in a long time. Those ones in particular, your body really holds on to. So, of course, it's in everything. Um, Dr. Thomas, I know yes. Which one? The halogens. The halogens. Halogens, that's halogens. it. Yes, thank you. See, I was like, I had to ah, memorize this. And she heard the word halogen and the light came on. Thank you. Thomas, thank you. He's yes. our, our resident uh, chemist, Thomas, is with us today. <laughs> yes, we weren't planning on talking this much detail tonight, but you guys got lucky. <laughs> yeah. But yes, yeah, so the toxins can build up in your body too. So they're stored in the fat. So if an animal is not raised properly, if they're raised with uh, dirty, unfiltered water, if they're eating food that's contaminated, et cetera, it holds it in the in the fat especially. It's in the muscle and stuff too, so you got to be careful. Sure. But that's why you want to spend the money on better quality meats. Oh, Cleo, you're going to be <laughs> running sorry. away. She's almost famous. Come here. Help us with our YouTube stardom. No. So. Fat cat. Fat cat. <laughs> so there you go. So that's the different types of fat. The mono and polyunsaturated, saturated, and then avoid trans fat. And then the, I would say the other bad sources of fat, like the soybeans. We already talked about how legumes aren't good for you. And, and soy, especially since they, the GMOs, it's changed and it messes with your hormones. Now this makes more sense, right? So you don't want to be doing that. Um, so you want a, to, a note on soy. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but okay. a note on soy or soybean oil is that um, if you look, I, I, as a diet coach, I've had to do this. I want to know what's in food because I get that question all the time. Is it okay if I have blank? Um, so the, the answer is if you look at any commercial um, salad dressing, you walk down that aisle, take the time if you want to. <laughs> I've done it for you, but if you feel like doing it yourself. You pick up those those salad dressings and turn them over. It does not matter. They'll say made with olive oil, but they also have soy oil in them also. Mm -hmm. they, they always do. Soy oil is a chemically derived. If you took a soybean and squeezed it as hard as you could, you would never get oil out of it. Mm -hmm. It's a chemical process that converts it to an oil. It is an extremely shelf stable oil that never, hello, that never um, oxidizes essential. I shouldn't say never, but it takes an awful long time for it to oxidize. So you can leave that stuff on, a, on the shelf and it won't go bad. Good uh, for the shelf life of your salad dressing, bad for your liver. Exactly. Well, and your liver is responsible for filtering out toxins and it treats these bad fats as a toxin. It's one of the reasons why um, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is a thing. 
because if you're constantly, I, I forgot to say this during the sugar talk, but fructose is treated like a toxin. Your body doesn't really know what to do with it, um, especially high fructose corn syrup. Because again, corn, you don't squeeze corn to make oil. You don't squeeze corn to make sugar like that. It's a chemical process and your body is like, I don't know what the hell this is. So just put it in the fat cells, we'll deal with it later. Right. So that's it'll what- impacts it around the liver. And stuff yeah, and it'll, it'll keep it comfy and cozy. So and what ends up happening is you can give yourself non-alcoholic fatty liver disease when you're eating a lot of fructose. And who doesn't want that? Right? Or when you're eating these bad fats or when you're eating, uh, or you're taking a lot of medications because medications have to be filtered through your liver too and it can put a lot of stress on it. Mm. Um, it's one of the diagnosable parts of um, <laughs> metabolic syndrome, which we'll talk about more later. But there you go. So if you eat enough fat in your diet, you really shouldn't have to supplement. Mm -hmm. But if you can't quite get enough fat in you, you can also supplement. Um, sure. So there's different types of um, supplements, as I'm sure you guys have heard of omega-3 and omega-6s. Mm -hmm. Ooh, another type of fat. Yay, more quizzes. <laughs> so Essential fatty acids. Exactly. So these are um, essential fatty acids, which means they're essential, which means you can't make them yourself. You need to consume them. Uh, is, this, is that like essential oils? You just, just drink it. <laughs> so essential means you need to consume it. You can't make it yourself. So you can make like the cholesterol and stuff, but you make it from these essential fatty acids. So omega-3 and omega-6s, are they are both polyunsaturated, and they're both considered essential. They're named for the number of carbon bonds at the end. So the omega-3s have three, the omega-6s have six. Weird, I know. So Next time you're on Jeopardy. So again, omega-6 to omega-3, like everything else, is important to have the appropriate ratio. Sure. You should be having a 6 to 3 at a 4 to 1 ratio max. Mm -hmm. You should be still have more omega-6s than 3s, but you want to have it close to that 4 to 1 category. Once it starts to get higher, especially on the 6, which we'll talk about, it's very inflammatory. And the more inflammation you have, the more sickness and disease and, and ill health you experience. And the average American's uh, ratio is closer to 10 to 30 times to one. Mm -hmm. This is a good time to, to hop in here and say that once again, just like HDL and LDL. You um, still need them. Yeah, this, the, a, this omega-6 is bad, omega-3 is good. No, 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 no. They're, they're both necessary in the, ra in, in the ratios that, that the doc talks about. And um, one of the things that, the, the, that is advised to people is that you eliminate omega-6 uh, containing foods, but that's a really hard thing to do because, um, well, it's, it's, it's hard. It's also unnecessary in a lot of ways. It's hard because the amount of omega-6 in a particular food is not a steady constant. Mm -hmm. Beef is usually touted as being really high in omega-6. Well, it depends on how it's fed. If it's fed yeah. grain, it it's going to be. be high in omega-6. If it's fed grass, it'll be high in omega-3. Exactly. And the, the mix of six to three in grass-fed beef is exactly the ratio that you just mentioned. It's actually it's actually really, really good. Um, a lot of nuts, macadamia, uh, pistachio nuts, walnuts tend to have a pretty even split between uh, omega-3s and omega-6s. Nature knows what to do, and it was trying to keep us in balance. We're the ones who insisted on changing it. We built a factory and tried to make food in it. <laughs> exactly. That's yeah. What so, went wrong. Exactly. Yeah. No. It's things in nature tend to be in the correct ratios, mm -hmm. or like food pairing. Uh, we'll talk about this. In, uh, we'll have to do a separate one on this. But like, just the art of food pairing. Back in the day, re recipes had a rhyme and a reason to them. Like having some salty and some sweet because they ba balance out. Putting in some bitters afterward, then swallowed. Like all this stuff, all this food combination. The way we used to cook and was. Soup was more balanced, no soup for you. So, <laughs> no soup for you. <laughs> so everything was more balanced and we, and our ancestors figured this out. They just, they just kind of knew and they passed it along and we've kind of lost it. And that's like, cause when you're eating a uh, Dunkaroos or whatever, the, kid, <laughs> the kids are eating nowadays. <laughs> yeah, who, yeah, I was like Dunkaroos, I remember Dunkaroos. Who knew those were bad for you? Nobody, how could, Graham crackers with chocolate paste to be bad for you. I find that Pop Rocks are bad for you. <laughs> Especially when you mix it with Coke. <laughs> but what ends up happening is most of these uh, these bad oils, if you will, they're mostly omega-6s. 
And there's also two types of omega-6s. So omega-6 gets a bad rap, but there are two types, essentially. I'm just going to, I'm going to simplify it down, but you've got um, pro-inflammatory and then anti-inflammatory. So you've got the GLA, which is gamma linolenic. Say that five times fast. Gamma GLA. They tend to be more anti-inflammatory, and those are the ones that help to decrease disease, like all the inflammatory diseases. Yeah. That's what you find in like uh, borage oil, evening primrose oil, and black currant seed oil. So we sell all three of those. It will shock you to find out. Turns out. Exactly. So those ones are anti-inflammatory when you need the sixes. Um, when you have a bad six, they tend to have arachidonic acid or um, ARA, sometimes AA. It depends on how they abbreviate it. But arachidonic acid tends to be pro-inflammatory, and it's all just around where the chemical chain, where they start to branch off, because everything can turn into everything else. But the arachidonic acid tends to be more inflammatory, and of course, that's what you're going to find in your food, like the soybean oil and all that stuff. They all, that all tends to be the inflammatory omega-6s. Right. Then you have omega-3, which everybody has heard is Yay, good for you. Omega-3. Omega-3. So there's a couple different types of omega-3. Yes. One is EPA. So, Dad, where are you? You wanted me to do this. <laughs> I'll make him watch it later and quit. Yeah, he, call, he called up and said, what's the difference between EPA and DHA? And DHA. You didn't go over that. I was like, that's a different talk. I told him to be here. So EPA. Now he'll never know. <laughs> Brian will never know. So EPA is eicosapentaenoic acid. That's why we call it EPA. You were braver than me. I right? Do that. It helps to make eco eicosanoids. Yeah. The, that you got to learn Latin, and it decreases inflammation. So EPA is very good for being anti-inflammatory. Then you've got DHA, which is docosahexanoic acid. <laughs> Look at me. <laughs> DHA is not necessarily anti-inflammatory, but it makes up about 8% of your brain's weight. So it's kind of important for brain health. I hope it's not all on one side. So at the office, we got new products called Ulprima. EPA, Ulprima, Ulprima DHA, and Ulprima EPA DHA. So the EPA is mostly EPA, and that one is typically used for heart health. And why? Because it's anti-inflammatory. <laughs> <laughs> the DHA is mostly used for brain health. <laughs> it all makes sense. And then the EPA DHA is in the appropriate balance in which it's found in nature and you're supposed to have. So if someone's kind of like in between, you can do that. We also sell a product. So or, if they're if they're if they're depressed and heartbroken, <laughs> that one. <laughs> so we sell um a test. It's called a Mega Quant. So what it is is a blood prick test, and you mail it in, and then they get you your results, and it tells you where are you with like your omega threes, and it's checking this kind of stuff to see what's your ratios. What and, have you been doing wrong? Exactly. I'm actually my dad did it. Good job, dad. And I told him like we'll go over your results. And one of the things it checks for too is how much trans fats in there because they can see from the cell membranes because you are what you eat. It's not a joke. So if you have cells made of good fat that you're eating and because you, things are constantly dying and rebuilding. So if you have the appropriate building blocks, you can build healthy cells, you can build healthy pieces. But if it's like, well, oh, we've, we've got nothing good, but we've got this trash, I guess we'll use the trash. So then it makes trashy it's gotta, cells. got to do something. It's got to do something where you, you just die. So, um, so that's a thing that you can um, do too. You can check these levels. Death is bad. Death is bad. Okay. And then you've got <laughs> ALA, which is alpha linolenic acid. That one can be converted to EPA or DHA. So it's mainly used to make energy for the body. You so, have to call the FDA. <laughs> so typically, when you're taking supplements, you're usually taking EPA and or DHA. Most people aren't taking ALA because ALA, what happens is it turns into these two and some people can't do the conversion very well. Mm -hmm. And if you can't convert it very well, it's not really helping. So we tend to do the EPA, DHA. So that is what ends up happening. And what they found, I'm going to read off all this list. And this is from the, the medical doctors. This isn't for me. The omega-3s improve heart and mental health. Hmm, I wonder why. Um, they reduce waist size and weight for the reasons we talked about. Do you about. rub it on? <laughs> It decreases liver fat. Mm -hmm. It supports infant brain development. Obviously, we talked about the myelin. I don't know. It fights inflammation. It prevents dementia and promotes bone health and prevents asthma because asthma is very inflammatory. There you go. So y'all should be 
consuming a very high quality fish oil. Exactly. So yeah, if you're not able to get enough healthy fat in your diet, you should consider a fish oil and when or another supplement. You should definitely talk to your healthcare provider, mm -hmm. preferably one that uses standard process because they make the highest quality supplements. They make sure because one of the problems with fish at this point, again, we have to do a, like a what's in your food talk. Um, we'll do that after we're done with all the immune stuff. But when you start to look into it, we just talked about the difference between grain fed and grass fed. The same thing is happening to fish. So when they're doing fish farms, like literally they right. keep them in the water in corrals and stuff. Some of them, it's horrible. It's absolutely awful. Like uh, I'm, it makes me happy that I don't eat fish. Mm -hmm. So what happens though is like they, they just feed them garbage essentially. It's just like, oh, here's all the refuse. It's what they did with cows and chickens and stuff is they just feed them it's, whatever's it, laying around. It's basically the same story because they're all penned in and not enormous population in a small space. They feed them like antibiotics or they get sick. Uh, mm -hmm. If you're shopping for fish, um, yeah, out like there. free range. Free, yeah, wild, yeah, wild get, caught, get wild is, caught as much as possible. If you can't find what you want, wild caught. Uh, anything that comes from the European Union, any EU product mm -hmm. or Canada is going to be fine. Yeah, do comes, not buy American. Yeah, don't, don't buy American. And if it comes from Southeast Asia, yikes. Yeah, you got to. This is we're going to talk about all this stuff later, like in another. Like I said, what's in your food? We'll talk about farming practices and stuff like that because this is where it starts to get i think even more interesting it's unfortunate in the developing world they have the need to make you know to improve their economy and they don't necessarily have the same kind of restrictions on how their food is produced that we do here mm -hmm. or is that even better that the uh, european union does exactly everything's better in the eu frankly everything great great <laughs> no. <laughs> no, it's like, not everything. not everything but all of their food regulations are better. <laughs> yeah, it depends on what country you are. If you're Greece, it's a deal. <laughs> <laughs> you're Germany, not so much. <laughs> but yes, so that's why you need to look into high quality products. And because if you if you get a fish oil that's made from a place where the fish are not raised properly, sure. Um, uh, what ends up happening is like when a little fish gets eaten by a bigger fish, bigger fish, bigger fish, bigger fish. There's a word for this, I forgot. Um, but what happens is Hunger? that the no. When the little fish is <laughs> when the little fish has <laughs> sorry dog. <Doc. laughs> you're killing her. I'm sorry. Oh dear. <laughs> so you have Just the wipe, little wipe that camera. Oh no. Wipe the camera off. You're there. killing her. You're killing her. <laughs> She's our audience and you're killing her. <laughs> so when you have a little fish and he's been eating like stuff that's toxic because they're usually like filter fish, like the plankton and ah, stuff. I see what you're saying. When they get eaten by the next bigger one, it concentrates the toxins that are in it. And when Predator, he eats- Predatory chain, yeah. So it concentrates it all the way up. So like, I would not recommend eating like shark or swordfish or any of the bigger fishes. Delicious. Because when you eat these bigger fishes, they've been eating littler fish, we eat littler fish, we eat littler fish, and it concentrates the toxins up. So when, that's why when you look at concentrations mm. of toxins in fish, you'll find smaller fish tend to be safer, whereas like swordfish will have more toxins, toxins in it. It's the apex predators, right? The ones that are at the mm -hmm. top of the food chain who have consumed the, you know, the, the fish along the line. Mm -hmm. And what's the most commonly eaten fish in the United States of America? <clears throat> Tuna. Tuna. Which is an apex predator, actually. Exactly. So you got to be very careful. So like Oops. standard process, for example. I mean, it's a delicious apex predator. <laughs> but it's an apex predator. <laughs> So that's why like standard process, for example, they make sure that all of their stuff is as good as possible. Cause what's the point of taking a fish oil that has toxins in it? Sure. And like we said, the toxins are stored in the fat. And if the whole reason you're taking a fish oil is for the fat, then what are you doing? Yeah, right. So really, if you're taking a, a, like a GNC, a Walgreens, Walmart, CVS, if you're taking a cheap fish oil, you'd probably, probably be better off stopping. Yeah, probably Honestly. Uh, my, one of my favorites is uh, like the, um, what the big box clubs like uh, Walmart. Sam's Club. Sam's Club, the Sam's Club, Costco. Uh, Costco. If you can buy a metric ton for $35, Guess what? That's probably not the best fish oil for yeah. you. Well, it's like anything in life. You get what you pay for. And if you're like, oh, it's a great deal, it's probably not. And if you go to other species, by the way, that are a few further down the food chain, uh, mm -hmm. krill, you can buy krill oil, mm -hmm. um, which is at the bottom of the food chain, so they don't really get a lot of toxins. Uh, calamari oil is one of the most concentrated sources of, of both EPA and DHA. Mm -hmm. So we, we sell that too. We have cod liver oil, calamari <laughs> oil. 
tuna omega-3 oil. So it just depends on what you need. And so it's very, like I said, it's, it can get a little overwhelming. That's why you should talk to your healthcare professional before spending a lot of money on stuff that you may or may not be benefiting from. Sure. So depends on why you're taking it and we can help you with that. Exactly. And you can always ask us, we'll see what we can do to help. We can't diagnose like over the internet or anything like that, but we can set up a consult. Goldfish oil. Goldfish oil. From the fluttery fallen foes, the goldfish, <laughs> the apex predator. <laughs> so then uh, I wanted to go over the other benefits that the medical doctors know about fat, tuna oil, omega-3 oil in mm -hmm. particular. Like we said, lowers the risk of heart attack and stroke, prevents abnormal heart rhythms, lowers blood pressure, prevents arthrosclerosis, which is the hardening of your arteries, which is caused by sugar, um, lowers LDL and reaches HDL brain health. So it helps with anxiety, depression, ADHD. That's why a lot of kids, if you can get them on a fish oil, they tend to do better in school. Um, protects against cancer, helps support a healthy pregnancy because the baby's developing. That to me. Exactly. And <laughs> so there you go. So then next, since we already talked about what you should take, we wanted to talk about a little bit more the benefits of switching your, your body over to fueling on fat rather than sugar. Okay. So should we, you know what? Quick, here's how to do it. Stop eating sugar, start mm -hmm. eating fat. Done. Good night. Thanks for coming. <laughs> See ya. <laughs> so, <laughs> first of all, uh, fat fueling is our, um, it's natural absolutely state. our natural state. It is how we evolved. Um, there's a lot of work that's been done. To, to trace migration, early migrations of populations out of Africa, which you should know by now, every human being on the earth uh, has evolved out of the continent of Africa. Mm -hmm. That is where the we, cradle of life. It is the, yeah, it's exactly. It's Why the, there's a movie about it? It is the out of Africa. Uh, no, anyway, Tomb Raider, obviously. Tomb Raider out of Africa. <laughs> anyway, as we as we migrated, some of the, the early migrations tended to follow the coast, and it is believed. Uh, there's theories that, that the reason for that was that along the coastline, you've got clams, oysters, lobsters, just all kinds of stuff lives at the mm -hmm. edge of the sea that can be easily gotten, easily harvested, and easily eaten. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've grown up on basically fit, uh, oily fish that's high in EPA and DHA. Mm -hmm. um, when you, to convert, the process of converting to um, fat fueling is, it's, how do I put this? It is not complicated but it's not necessarily comfortable either. yeah well so the japanese um have different ways of saying basically difficulty so it's it's basically hard and then like difficult so it's hard to explain but basically like one it's of them to explain. yeah exactly <laughs> but you're making this tough oh, it's tough that's it tough and difficult I know. So it's tough to switch from uh, fueling on sugar to fueling on fats because it's a challenge. It's, it's, it's not always comfortable, but it's not difficult. It's not complicated. It doesn't have many steps. You can understand it. It's just hard to do. Yes. So for those of you who are interested- I'm going to go pack Cleo. I'll be right back. Because she's being, an, she's being neurotic. Yes. So for those of you who are interested in doing this, here's, here's the thing. What you should do is if take a look at your diet and I think with a, a diet diary for seven days would be a great way to start and see just how much carbohydrate do you eat uh, once we find out let's say you your 90% of calories is carbohydrate it, we're gonna that's gonna tell us how quickly and how difficult or tough our transition is gonna be if you're 90% fueled on carbohydrates what we have to do is introduce a little bit more healthy and I recommend saturated fat no into your diet. Shit. This right here, this is saturated fat right there. Oh. Uh, so uh, coconut oil, palm oil, if you if you don't mind the taste of those, mix them in uh, with food. You can even get uh, a, a popular thing is called MCT oil, which is medium chain triglyceride oil. Fancy name for coconut oil that's been a little processed so it's liquid. Seen coconut oil in stores, you know that it's solid at room temperature, right? Uh, of course, it's 99 degrees here in Boston, so all our coconut oil is liquid right now. 
<laughs> but um, MCT oil, uh, two tablespoons of it a day mixed into your favorite tea or coffee or other hot beverage is a great way to start introducing fat into your diet. Yeah, the Bulletproof Coffee? Yeah, which is sometimes called Bulletproof Coffee. It's a great recipe. A tablespoon of MCT oil, about a teaspoon of uh, grass-fed butter. Butter from grass-fed cows. You don't eat butter anything. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> um, you're going to need a blender. Whirl that up in your in your morning coffee. It is absolutely decadent. Decadent. It's absolutely delicious. It's and actually it's, really good. I was I was like, I don't know. This is before we were together. I was like, you are a little crazy, aren't you? <laughs> nope, I am not a little crazy. No, I'm crazy. Well, I'm crazy. But I tried it, and I'm one of the pickiest eaters, if you will, that you can find. It's delicious. And it's really, really good. It really is. Don't bite me. It's but really so, is. yeah, no, it's really, really good. My trick with the Bulletproof coffee is don't blend it too long. If you blend it too long, it cools off the coffee too much, and then it all starts to congeal, and that's gross. It's yummy. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, there's a lot of aftermarket stuff now. People are, are, are creating um, something you can pour into your coffee that, to make it Bulletproof. It's just the mix that I just mentioned, only they use emulsifiers to keep it liquid. They put chemicals to preserve it. Which and now, just all sudden, over. And now all of a sudden I'm getting a whole lot of things. I went paleo so I wouldn't have to eat this stuff. Now I got a thing that says paleo on it that has all that stuff back in it. Exactly. Don't, don't, don't do it. Don't do it. Um, so yeah, uh, bulletproof coffee is a great way to add fat to your diet. If you mm -hmm. don't drink coffee, that's fine. You can add coconut oil to pretty much any meal that you've got. Yeah. I, I like it enough to eat it straight off the tablespoon. I Me too. If I have. Or if I'll have to get you guys a recipe. I have a wonderful coconut oil chocolate recipe. All right, so we're talking about unsweetened oh, cocoa yeah. with um, coconut oil. Exactly. It. Yeah, no, it's fantastic. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, and you have to use Unless you're solid. allergic to chocolate like some people. <laughs> I think the amount of chocolate you'd be getting in it is minimal and wouldn't bother you too much. But I use um, the high quality um, green and black cocoa powder. It's unsweetened. I have to get it on like Amazon at this point. You can't find it in the store. You can find the green and black cocoa like chocolate bars, but you just use the powder. The solid coconut oil, not the liquid, because then it doesn't firm up. <laughs> so, Oops. Someone was like, I tried liquid. I was like, oh my God. But anyway. So you do that, you add like a touch of vanilla, a touch of um, maple syrup to make it a little bit sweeter if you want to. Or skip that part or if you've got sugar. Exactly. And then you pour it into little molds, put it in the fridge or the freezer, and let them harden. And then I pop them out, put them in a, a container I keep in the, the fridge, and it's a little sh a fat blast. But it's it's the best chocolate. I'm the best chocolate you ever had. It really is. Like people are always like, oh, don't you like this or that? And I'm like, no, I don't like that garbage chocolate garbage. anymore. No, because when you have the coconut oil <laughs> chocolate, it's so smooth and it's so nice. And when you start to eat like uh, conventional chocolate, you're like, this is really waxy and weird yeah. and it doesn't taste right. So I'm very picky on my chocolate at this point because of this. You but you can have that laying around and then if you're like, oh, I'm a little bit hungry, just pop one and go. Pop that stuff. You can add uh, healthy fats to your diet by simply eating more fish, mm -hmm. especially oily fishes like salmon. Um, if you, I realize that, that mm -hmm. the, the American palate has narrowed more and yeah. more and more as years go by. Um, we used to eat sardines back in the day. This you was still eat them. I still eat them because it's a fantastic source that nobody's, <laughs> there are no farm raised sardines as it turns out. They're all wild caught. Um, <laughs> they can't keep them in the spot. You, they're tiny. How are you going to? Um, so I, I do. I eat sardines from about two or three times a week. I make sure I have a, a dose of sardines. He's I like, get I, want, I don't want her kissing me tonight. <laughs> Every action has consequences. <laughs> but I, li I like sardines. I like anchovies too. I don't need a case of them at once. because that. But I don't mind a little bit. If you don't mind them, uh, my advice is... Um, Sardines can be packed in all kinds of stuff, so read your labels. They come often in soy oil. We already talked about that. We ain't doing that. Um, olive oil, which we say is good for you, but olive oil comes in all kinds of qualities. Yes, and typically if it's not like extra virgin cold-pressed olive oil, which is right. not what they're using in a can. Right. Um, well, you have to understand how these um, – I don't know if anybody knows this. Do you know this? You know your tuna and your sardines and all canned fishes? They are canned raw, and then the can – subjected to high heat to cook it in the can. Did you know that? The cans are steamed and that's how that's cooked. So we already went over how olive oil goes rancid. You don't want to overheat olive oil because it, it, it wrecks its positive uh, qualities. So uh, the, your, your sardines in olive oil, that can's probably been heated very high 
and that olive oil is no longer that good for you. So I get it in spring water, because spring water boiled is called it's water. Steam, so <laughs> yeah. It's okay, so get them in spring water. I, uh, European brands, like I said, mm -hmm. um, King Oscar, which comes from uh, Norway, I believe. Great, great, great stuff. Uh, if you like it, if you don't like it, learn to like it. Or take the supplements <laughs> like I do. Or take the pills, yeah, yeah you really I can't don't... eat fish. Yeah, like uh, you can also take like flaxseed oil, like if you're looking for more vegetarian yep. flaxseed oil, that kind of stuff. You can, Certainly. You I can mean, do co that. Coconut oil, flaxseed oil, those are those are all fine. Yeah, um, we have one called Linum B6. It's it's just flaxseed. Yeah. Um, it's 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 fine. It's all good. You just have to get good fats in you because if you don't, you're just you're either going to be fueling on sugar or you're going to be if you're doing bad fat. It's it's not bad, it's not ideal. Bad. So don't be, I guess the, the, the point of tonight is, is, with all this detail, it comes down to this. Don't be afraid. For, for two generations now, we've been told to be afraid of eating fat, and it just isn't true. Mm -hmm. I have been principally fat-fueled. I started in, in October of 2010. 10, 10, 10, because mm -hmm. I'm like that. I'm a drama queen. <laughs> so I chose this day because I knew I'd remember the date. I started principally fueling myself on fat being mostly uh, paleo and almost entirely keto for most of the time. Mm -hmm. I stayed in ketosis for most of it. Um, and I have had absolutely zero negative health out outcomes for from close to a decade of eating like this. My cholesterol is the low lowest it has ever been. Mm -hmm. um, my, my eyesight's fine. My cognitive ability is mostly there. You know, considering the number of concussions I've had, <laughs> which is many, <laughs> more concussions this week than most people have in a lifetime. Um, no, um, yeah, no, can, all things considered, um, I'm, I'm 58 years old and I'm, I'm proud to say it because I'm in almost the best shape of my life. And a lot of it has to do with diet and a, and a big part of my diet is healthy sourced saturated fats. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, and then the last thing I'll say before we wrap it up is uh, last Tuesday when we did the sleep seminar or webinar here, um, I didn't eat all day. I ate the night before. Mm -hmm. So when I was doing the sleep talk, I was a little tired because I didn't, I only got like five hours the night before, but I was not tired because I hadn't eaten. I am also mostly fat based uh, with the fuel at this point. Yeah. Um, I've, we've been cleaning up our diet during like quarantine. We went a little off the rails, but we're back on just a little. Um, so I've been <laughs> cutting out all sorts of sugars. Um, I've, have gone no alcohol for at least a month because it, I mean, yes, <laughs> everyone's like, why right now? <laughs> Do you hate yourself? And it's like, <laughs> kind of, <laughs> no. um, it's because I'm, I just, I'm like, I want to feel better. And, um, you, you sometimes you have to cut out alcohol cause it converts to sugar and everything. It's not mm -hmm. primary fuel, but anyway, so I ate at like, we ate at like what, eight Late, the night yeah, before on Monday. I didn't eat anything on Tuesday until after we were done and this and it ran long. It was 8.30, 9 o'clock. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. we didn't eat until like 9.30 the night and I was fine. And I was on my feet from 12.30 to 6.45 because uh, I'm a chiropractor and an acupuncture. So I was treating people. I was go, 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 go. I was moving, moving, moving. And then we were doing the talk and I know I had a little trouble with some recall um, because I was a little bit tired. So it was but, really sleep deprivation. Yeah, but so, but it was, it was fine and um, Fat adaption means you can go longer without food. Mm -hmm. Fat adaption, you will find so you're if you try it. This. Yeah, you're, you're storing, you're storing it. Right, fat I adaption. Guess. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's adapting some fat right there. Fat <laughs> adaption means you can go longer without eating. It also means you will eat less mm -hmm. to get the same, basically fuel, if same amount of fuel substrate with less actual food. Your mm -hmm. your satiety and other feeling full. Yep. You'll feel full on less food. Um, mm -hmm. Intermittent it's, fasting is obvious and easy when you're fat adapted. Yeah, it's in, in the, the fat is like I said, so if you want to lose weight or you want to gain weight to get to a healthy weight, it doesn't really matter. Your body will find homeostasis. So it'll find the balance you're mm -hmm. supposed to be in when you eat fat. Right. So if you're supposed to lose weight, you'll lose it. If you're supposed to gain, you'll gain it so getting back to, to balance. But yeah, if you if you feel like you're never full after your meals, you probably just need a little bit more fat. It's mm -hmm. one of the reasons why like, people always joke about like Chinese food not making you feel full. It doesn't tend to have a ton of fat depending on if you're doing an Americanized Chinese. Yeah. It doesn't like it because if you're doing like stir fried rice, it's like what's even in the in there? It's it's not a lot of fat. It's all carb. Yeah. It's all carb. 
And that's one of the reasons why if you are fueling on sugar, if you're fueling on carbs, you're going to be hungry constantly because your satiety mechanisms aren't being switched by the fat consumption. And also your blood sugar starts to crash. So then you need to get back up again. So that's one of the reasons why this whole like, well, you should be eating constantly. Well, if you're constantly on sugar, you're constantly crashing. That makes sense. But when you are fueling on fat, you don't have the sugar crashes. I used to get, I used, I didn't used to get hangry. That was my sister, but she would get hangry, like cut off your face angry when she was hungry. It was, I'd be like, are you, are you hungry? <laughs> Do you want a snack? Are you in a period? <laughs> like, you know, so because it was just, she got really hangry because she was very sh uh, sugar fueled. Because when we were growing up, we, you know, we were, we ate really well for a long time. But once we started to turn into teenagers, that's when everybody starts to go off the rails. We're doing a lot of soda. So she used to crash really hard. Um, so we, and I'm sure I did too, but it wasn't, it, I just remember, I doubt it. I'm perfect. Yep. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, so if you're if you're fueling on sugar, you're gonna be moody. You're gonna have the crashes. You're gonna get hangry. You're gonna get shaky. You're gonna get forgetful. You're gonna feel moody. You're gonna feel blues. Yep. It, it really like some depression is actually just because you're fueling on carbs. Um, you're gonna have trouble sleeping. You're gonna have trouble falling asleep. You're gonna have trouble staying asleep. <laughs> like it really starts to filter out. But when you're fueled on fat. Yep. It smooths all those rough edges it's, right out. It's difficult sometimes in these conversations with diet clients to, to when you guys start telling them that basically every problem in their life will be solved. They just ate some coconut oil. It, it's, it you, sounds, you ludicrous, see, it sounds insane, right? It sounds like, well, how can this one thing be the panacea of all things? It's, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's, a cure -all. <laughs> it's not at all a cure all. What it is, is it's a food that doesn't cause disease. Mm -hmm. And that's why it seems like it fixes everything. It yeah. doesn't fix everything. It just doesn't break as many things. Well, at, at some point when you're choosing what to eat, when you're choosing things to put in your mouth to fuel your body, it either creates health or it causes disease. Mm -hmm. There's like, there's really nothing neutral. Right. It's, it's just, it's either good for you or it's bad for you. It can be like a little bad. It can be a lot bad, but if it's bad, it's bad. Mm -hmm. And same thing with good. It's, you know, and you make that choice every time you pick up your fork or whatever. So speaking of picking up forks, exactly. We got to go get some food and go smush that cat. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the skinny on fat. I hope that all made sense. Skinny on fat. <laughs> yes, um, he came up with the title. I thought it was great. So next week we are talking about exercise and immunity. Oh, so you're going to hear mostly him talking. Oh God! <laughs> hey, I will tell. Yeah, the, we're going to talk about that. It's going to be a lot of fun. That one, it's this. We won't have such um, such deep science. Uh, it's a lot more direct. It's a lot easier, and we'll maybe even get to sh have time to show you a couple of things. If you don't exercise, you can do that'll boost your immunity, but not um, you know, drive you to the gym so you can catch COVID from the guy next to you. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so thank you for joining us. If you like that video, hit like. And subscribe to our channel. It helps us out. We're trying to grow. Yeah. And this way, um, when you like and subscribe, it helps get other people to see this information. Yes. And it, I think, you know, the reason we're doing this is to try to improve everyone's health and just reach more people because I, I think it's really important that people know and there's lots of conflicting information out there. Right. So thanks again, guys, and have a good night. Bye, guys. <laughs>